My name is Kwazima Chola. I'm the chair of the uh, Gauteng branch in the, in the groundwater division of the Geological Society of South Africa. And today we are re <laughs> redoing the, the presentation by uh, Dr. Kathiso Liketa, because last week we had the inter, uh, internet problems or connection problems. Therefore, we decided to reschedule to today. He is going to be uh, presenting his study, his research studies. And the topic today is stable isotopes in precipitation and the assessment of groundwater recharge mechanisms in the Johannesburg region. Just briefly, he did his uh, BSc at the National University of Lesotho. From there, he went to the University of Free State, which is the Institute for Groundwater Studies to get his master's, and then he got his PhD at the University of the Vet Vatas Ranch in South Africa. He is a, a, a published author and a researcher. An academic is now based in the University of Lesotho as a lecturer after working with the Department of Water Affairs in Lesotho for some time. And just a few house rules. We are recording the meeting, number one. Secondly, we ask you as you enter to please write your name and affiliation in the chat box. We use that as, a, as an attendance register. And for those who need the significant points, they will get them, they must uh, register in the chat box. We ask that you keep your videos and your microphones off because of the bandwidth problems. We would love to see everybody. We have not seen each other for a long time, but please keep your videos off for this, it's necessary. And then if you want to ask a question, you're welcome to raise your hand using the icons or emojis at the bottom of your screen. That will be at the end of the presentation. And you can also, as the presentation goes, you can type your questions in the, in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation as well. So with that said, I don't want to waste more time and we are crossing all the figures and everything crossable that today we are not <laughs> disconnected. <laughs> so um, Dr. Liketa, uh, you can take it away. Thank you. All right, all right. thank you. Thank you very much, Kwasi. And uh, thank you to the Granata Division of the Geological Society of South Africa for having offered this opportunity to share uh, with uh, the colleagues in the groundwater field um, on some of the work that we did in part of the work that we did in Johannesburg as part of my study. Uh, as Kwasi has indicated, uh, my name is Hasiso Likita. I currently work for the National University of Lesotho as a lecturer. I teach courses in hydrology and water resources and um, I also do research as well in the in the field of water resources. I've developed uh, quite uh, quite an interest in in the use of isotopes in the in, in understanding the uh, hydrological processes. So today I'm going to be sharing with you um, the part of the work that we did that uh, that is related with stable isotopes, the use of stable isotopes uh, in this. Uh, presentation that is titled Stable Isotopes in Precipitation and the Assessment of Groundwater Recharge Mechanisms in Johannesburg Region. This work I did as, as part of my PhD under the supervision of Professor Tamiru Abie at the University of the Bitwater Strand. Thank you. Let's get into the meat of our presentation. Okay. The, the primary aim of this presentation is to bring to you or to present to you what the, the, the work that we did in, in, in Johannesburg, uh, in as far as stable isotopes are concerned, uh, but to also say that uh, we, are, we also want to understand the rainfall patterns in, in the Soto uh, and to also try and understand the, the, uh, the altitude issues between you know, the Soto and Johannesburg, and of course, some of the, of the regional rainfall in the region as we move further on. So we're trying to say, let's present to you what we did in Johannesburg so that also due to your, as you add your own inputs, your own questions and inputs, we're able to refine what was done in Johannesburg and try to do a more uh, um, uh, 
a more detailed uh, assessment from this side. So the specific objectives of this study are to establish the Johannesburg, the Johannesburg local material quarter line to assess the rainfall, rainfall subcloud re-evaporation on light rainfall, and then to also assess the air particle trajectory models for rainfall moisture source identification. We're trying to say, apply certain models to try and understand, to try and understand some of the um, estimates that were done using stable isotopes to, where we were trying to, to identify the moisture sources, to assess the groundwater research mechanisms. And of course, number five, which is the ongoing isotope work in the SO2, which I'll just share with you what we have done so far and where we aim to go. All right, um, let's get into it. So uh, I'm going to start by talking about, just briefly talking about what are isotopes. Because if you look at the title of this presentation, it says that stable isotopes in precipitation and the assessment of groundwater research mechanisms in the Johannesburg region. So I'm trying to say, can I just, let me just bring people who are here, people who perhaps may not have a very clear understanding of what isotopes are, just to bring this, uh, just a little bit of, of an understanding of what we are talking about. So going back to the basic, basic chemistry that I, which I believe most of us, we, we encountered um, somewhere in our, in our schooling. Um, we understand that if each element in the periodic table, each element is made up of atoms. So each atom has got what we call electrons that are orbiting around, you know, and there's that what we call a nucleus. A nucleus inside, it, 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 it consists of the neutrons and the protons. And we understand that uh, the mass of the, the mass of an atom, what we, what we call an atomic mass, it consists of a, it's the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So what we understand is that uh, uh, what you should understand is that the, the some some atoms of the same element in this periodic table, they have got different number of neutrons. So so, 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 so they have a different number of neutrons, which makes them therefore to have a different number of, uh, or rather a different mass number. So when we define an isotope, we say an isotope, they are atoms of the same element with different mass numbers due to different number of neutrons. This will, will clarify this as, as we move on as to why then we're able to apply this or how we're able to apply it in the study of hydrology or in the study of water resources. Now, when we look at, just to explain what I just, just to elaborate on what I just explained now, this is a, a water molecule, as you know, sorry, a drop of water or water from anywhere, from any natural system, as you may find it. Uh, this water as it is, it has got atoms, some of which have got, some of those atoms have got eight neutrons, while some, they have got 10 neutrons. In other words, if we are saying that the mass of an atom it's made up of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. It tells us that the uh, uh, some some atoms of oxygen, for example, they will have a mass number of sixteen, while some they will have a mass number of what of eighteen, which makes it therefore to have different masses. So, in other words, some atoms will will be lighter, and the other ones will be heavier, because we understand that the mass of an atom is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So, it makes oxygen 18 to be heavier than oxygen 16. So this is the basic principle that we are, that, 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 en that enables us to use isotopes in the study of hydrology, okay? So why then, isot why isotopes in hydrology? Because they're able to, to, to we're able to, to determine the preferential evaporation of light isotopes. When evaporation occurs in a water body, in a dam or somewhere, the lighter isotopes, they prefer to be in the vapor phase. So, as soon as evaporation occurs, the light isotopes, they preferentially move into the vapor phase and leave the heavier isotopes behind. They, they preferentially, in other words, they preferentially, there is a preferential accumulation of heavier isotopes in the liquid phase and the preferential uh, 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 escape of lighter isotopes into the heavier phase through the process that is called fractionation. So, so because of that, then we're able to, to characterize mechanisms of recharge. That's how then we get to, we get to, we get to relate this to our study of, uh, or to our field, which is hydrogeology. So the isotopes in rainfall, they, 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 they vary based on the isotope effects. Just, let me just simply say that uh, then we understand that the heavier isotopes, they are more depleted. In other words, they are, uh, uh, sorry, the heavy rainfall is depleted. It is it has more affinity to the lighter isotopes. You know, it is more negative. Uh, let me just put it like that, uh, just simply like that. Uh, and then heavier rainfall is enriched. So because of that fractionation process that I explained, there is this 
uh, uh, it, it enhances this uh, where we are saying the heavy rainfall is slightly depleted. It has a certain isotopic signature, which shows a depletion in heavy isotopes. And the lighter rainfall, it has a certain isotopic signature that is, that, that is inclined towards the heavier isotopes. So because of this, we are able to study our rainfall and our groundwater and our mm. mechanism for groundwater recharge. So mm. the rain through, the rain, you know, similarly, rain that falls through the warm air, it tends to be enriched because of the escape of uh, as, as water falls through a drier atmosphere or a hot atmosphere, there's an escape of lighter isotopes in, in enabling um, uh, uh, what an, a more enriched rainfall. Uh, <clears throat> so let's now get into our study, which, which, is, uh, which is in Johannesburg. Uh, this is the map of South Africa. Uh, our study was in the, in the upper Crocodile River Basin. It's in the bigger Limpopo uh, River. Yes, in the Limpopo catchment, but we are in the upper Crocodile River basin. So that's where our, our study area is. Uh, that is where our study area is. Uh, uh, I think the Department of Water Affairs, they refer to that catchment as A21. So it's, it's based in Johannesburg. On the boundary, on the boundary of, uh, of this catchment at the, you know, at the at the catchment divide. That's where Johannesburg is at the south southmost catchment divide. Uh, that's where uh, Johannesburg is. So so that on the north we have the Upper Crocodile River Basin. On the south we have the Val catchment. So <clears throat> the study that I'm presenting today, it is made up of. It consists of. Uh, assessments that were done in Johannesburg and at the Hatebe Sport Dam. Let me just mention that Hatebe Sport Dam is where, it's a dam that drains the whole of Johannesburg, the whole of the north, northern Johannesburg, north of, the, of this ridge here. So what we did is that uh, in Johannesburg, we collected the rainfall samples and we also determined the uh, we also took uh, samples from from a spring, which which uh, which discharges from the park site uh, on the catchment boundary. So these are the two areas where we where this study that I'm presenting today was performed or was done. Okay, so the the catchment has got quite a, a complex geology. Uh, in Johannesburg, we have quite quite a lot of quartz sites. Consists of quartz sites when you. If you drive into, into Johannesburg, you realize that there's quite a lot of uh, quartzite, highly fractured quartzite there, which uh, we could, which we say that it enhances quite a lot of recharge there. And also at the Hatebe Sport Dam, we have got quite a lot of shale here, and I'll talk about, I'll show the the fractures, the faults as well. There are two faults that cut across this dam, uh, which also which was also one reason that aroused our interest to to study how the dam then uh, interacts with the regional aquifers in the in the area the the the, 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 the aquifers that surround the dam um so this is the this is our study area okay this is where we where where we did our study so uh, the first of some specific objective it said that to establish the Johannesburg local natural water line. So basically, uh, we understand that uh, because of the, because we said that the isotopes in precipitation, they vary with temperature, latitude, continental effect, and elevation, and so on and so forth. We understand, therefore, that rainfall in different parts of the world, it, it, it has a different isotopic signature. It has a certain range of isotopic signatures. Uh, you expect a certain signature in a certain area somewhere. So meaning that different areas across uh, around the world, they have their distinctive isotopic signature that defines their rainfall from there. It may not be exact, but it, it certain, certain ranges that define rainfall from there. So in other words, each area has, has its own local mature water. Uh, its own local uh, um, uh, sorry, Katiso. Can I ask everybody to please mute yourselves, your microphones? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So each area has got its own local local mature water line, uh, which has its own slope and its own d-axis. D-axis is more like your 
your, your Y intercept, okay? So because of that, okay, when we started this study in 2016, we had the, the Pretoria Local Meteor Report Alliance, which was established using data from the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's based in, the station was based in, Joha, in Pretoria, sorry. And there was also one uh, Meteor Report Alliance from Cape Town, which was reduced by uh, uh, Roger Diamond, Roger Diamond and uh, Chris Harris. And then there was also later on, while I think we were done with our study, then they later on came the Toriando local major quarter line, which was established by the and others in 2019. Just to say these are the, the, the local major quarter lines that we observed in, the, in this area. So uh, this enabled us to say that it was important for us to establish what we call the local major quarter line. Basically, uh, if you look at Pretoria, for example, Pretoria, we said that uh, stable isotopes, they vary also depending on the temperature and, and uh, elevation as well. Johannesburg is much more elevated than Pretoria. And uh, Johannesburg is slightly cooler than Pretoria, with around about two degrees Celsius almost every day. Daily, daily temperatures, almost every day, you find that Johannesburg is slightly cooler than Pretoria, with around about two degrees Celsius or so. So, which enabled or which uh, justified the need for us to say, let's then develop the local material water line for, for the Johannesburg region. But also because it was, uh, it was, we, uh, we wanted to study the processes in the in the catchment, so it was it was uh, justifiable to to, to establish a local material quarter line for that area. So we talk about the local material quarter line. We're just saying a, a y is equal to mx plus c, as we know it's the a simple uh, trend line. So also we we understand that so the d axis, the deuterium axis that we that we find deuterium axis. I said the deuterium axis is your it's your, it's, it's your y-intercept, okay? Your deuterium axis and your slope of a local material quarter line, they give you information on the conditions at the moisture source. It, they try to explain to you what conditions were prevailing at the moisture source, where evaporation occurred. Two, what conditions were prevailing along the route where the moisture was flowing, was, was, was moving through, what conditions were there. Also, they also carry information on what sort of atmosphere did the rainfall interact with after, after the condensation process has occurred? After condensation, what sort of atmosphere, uh, what sort of air uh, did the rainfall interact with? So basically that's what we aim to, that's the information that we draw from what we call a local material water line. So we established these simple rain gauges. It's a simple rain gauge that's probably, that is most likely that is most often used by farmers in their farms. It's just a simple rain gauge. So because we understood that, uh, that the process of evaporation causes an escape of lighter isotopes, and we understand that as evaporation occurs, the light isotope, they, 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 they escape, meaning that the water that is left, it becomes more enriched. Therefore, evaporation alters the isotopic signature of our rainfall. We don't want our rainfall to undergo evaporation before our analysis. So we made sure that every time after rainfall, every time it rains, as soon as it stops, we pick a sample. So that's that was one way to control our, our data. So we collected this data over three years from 2015 to 2018 on daily rainfall. And we analyzed this, uh, the samples of daily rainfall at the University of the Witwatersrand using this uh, liquid water isotope analyzer model 45PP at Vets University Hydrogeology Lab. That's what we did. And then we were able to plot our data, um, our, our data in this fashion, and we generated the local mature water line, which was uh, six point, which had a slope of 6.7 and a deuterium excess of 10. So this is our material quarter line, which was then ready for research assessment in this version. So objective number one, gone. So we are going into stable of effects and rainfall subplot with evaporation on light rainfall. So in this case, we're able to, uh, we wanted to, to determine, of course, theoretically, we understand that as, 
as we understand that light rainfall is light rainfall is uh, is is enriched and heavy rainfall is depleted that's what we understand heavy rainfall is likely depleted and light rainfall is enriched so we wanted to plot our data on a daily series using time series on a daily time time steps so that we can identify the we can identify each rainfall event and match it with the amount of rainfall and the temperature to see how the response was how to see if we can identify the amount effect and temperature effect in, in, in a in a time series setup. So using data from 2016 to 2018, we we're able to, to, to come up with this plot. And if you can just look at, for example, uh, arrow number zero, no, it's O, O, uh, letter O. Um, you realize that uh, it's highly depleted. Okay, the orange lines are your temperature, average temperature, average daily temperature. This is your deuterium. This is your, sorry, this is your oxygen 18, and this one is your deuterium. So what we are seeing is that R number O, it says that the sample got depleted. It got depleted. We look at the amount, the amount was quite high as well. We are seeing amount effect there. Uh, of course, the temperatures also seemed to, to decline. It's, it could be a mix of both amount effect and uh, an increase in amount and also a decrease in temperature. Uh, we also, if we can just go into go look at arrow number N as well, we are seeing it's highly enriched with low rainfall. It, high, it is highly enriched. You almost can't see any rainfall here, but it's, it's highly enriched. We are seeing amount effect right there. F is, is depleted and it, and it also has a low air temperature. F is depleted, it's highly depleted. You can see over here, it's highly depleted. It, it also has a low temperature. The temperature fell very sharply here. Uh, so we're able to identify temperature and amount effect. Uh, so we're able to tell, we could tell that the highest stabilized variability is deduced, uh, or rather, it, it, we could think that, okay, it, it, it probably uh, the, the high variability that we are seeing could be could also be a result of the different moisture sources because we understand that the isotope the isotopes in rainfall they carry information about the moisture source about the, the continental uh, uh, continental uh, information you know how far we are from the ocean and so on and so forth but we also thought that it could also be related to the moisture sources which we then thought we would confirm using what you call this model called high, high split. It's, a, it's an online system which we'll talk about just now. Uh, so the stabilized effects in rainfall. Uh, so we're able to determine our, okay. Uh, so, sorry, just now, okay. Then DXS and slope of a mature quarter line, it depends on the temperature and humidity at sea surface. We talked about that just now. It's just a reminder, humidity along the moisture trajectory and occurrence of subcloud evaporation. And we understand that high relative humidity, high relative humidity at the sea surface, it, it leads to low DXS. Okay. High relative humidity at the surface where evaporation occur. If there was high relative humidity there, it would, we would know by the low deterrent excess in our local mature water line. Um, Subcloud evaporation, it leads to a decrease in deuterium excess, okay? If there was, if the, if the moisture experience, if experience, if the rainfall experienced subcloud evaporation after condensation, we would know because it leads to a decrease in D excess. So also subcloud evaporation causes a mature water line with a, with a slope less than eight, okay? Remember the 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 Craig's Clover Mature Quarter Line, which 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 it says that deuterium is equal to it has a slope of eight and a d excess of ten. So because of this, then we were we what we did is that we separated the heavy rainfall from the light rainfall, so that we we, we can say that uh, we we understand that the light rainfall it is enriched and the heavy rainfall is likely. Uh, it's depleted. So we separated the two in order for us to be able to understand the signature of rainfall that uh, that does not undergo uh, 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 subcloud evaporation, or rather to say, 
could we identify our moisture sources based on the amount of rainfall that we received? Okay. Anyway, so we, we decided that we separated them into less than 20 millimeters and greater than 20 millimeters. And we, we, we prepared the local, mat the mature water lines of both. And of course, still maintaining the, that one for all rainfall samples. Sorry. So, uh, what we were able to observe is that, uh, okay, this is what I just explained. There was a, a plot of all samples 2016 to 2018, and there was a plot B samples greater than or equal to 20 millimeters, plot C samples less than 20, less than 20 millimeters. And what we were able to observe is that the slope of light rainfall is lower than eight. You can see over here. This is your slope or your rainfall of less than 20 millimeters. It has a slope less than eight. Late eight, eight of the global mature quarter line by Craig, by Herman Craig. So, which denotes that subcloud evaporation, of, there is subcloud evaporation of light rainfall. Basically, what it means is that it says to us that when, after condensation has occurred in the atmosphere, in, in the upper atmosphere, after condensation has occurred below the clouds, the, the, it means that the light rainfall enhances or it, 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 uh, it experiences re evaporation whereby the heavier, the, the lighter isotopes, they evaporate, they re-evaporate into the atmosphere while the, 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 the heavier ones, while the, 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 heavier, one, the heavier isotopes, they, 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 they sort of uh, preferential accumulate in the raindrop as it falls through the clouds. So leading to an enriched, an enriched light rainfall. So one, there is rainfall, Re-evaporation in the subcloud on light rainfall. So there is a slope of the slope of uh, of eight on rainfall that is greater than or equal to twenty millimeters. So it denotes no subcloud re-evaporation. Okay, there is a slope of eight on on heavy rainfall which denotes that there is no subcloud re-evaporation, which of course makes uh, theoretical sense. Uh, so it shows that subcloud re-evaporation preferential occurs in the light rainfall. Okay, subcloud re-evaporation preferential occurs in the lighter in the light rainfall. So, in other words, if, if we look at the d-axis as well, rainfall greater than twenty millimeters gave a, a highest d-axis of eighteen point six deuterium excess. So, and, and the rainfall less than twenty millimeters gave a low yield of a low sorry a low d-axis of eleven point nine. So the low D excess in light rainfall means the subcloud re-evaporation occurs, which confirms, which still agrees with what we observed from the, uh, from the light rainfall. So a higher D excess of heat on heavy rainfall means less or no sign of subcloud re-evaporation. All this, they were able to assist us to characterize the, the isotopic signature of rainfall in the cloud and rainfall prior to condensation. Basically, we understand that the light rainfall, after condensation is okay, the light rainfall, it undergoes further isotopic alteration. But we understand that the heavy rainfall does not undergo isotopic alteration. So it still carries the isotopic signature of the, of the moisture in the cloud and perhaps moisture before condensation and route from where evaporation occurred. So we're able to, uh, we're able to then say that then the slope and d axis of heavy rainfall, they approximate incoming moisture. Okay, so the heavy rainfall it carries the isotopic signature of incoming moisture or in cloud con conditions prior to condensation. Carries the isotopic signature of moisture as it comes. How are the isotopic signature of moisture as it comes? That is one. Number two, how are the isotopic signature of the of the moisture inside the cloud? Those are some some of the information that we we're able to, to abstract from that. So as a result, high D excess indicates primary evaporation under warm sea surface temperature. We talked about uh, theoretical, what we understand by D excess. What does D excess mean to us? So the high D excess of 18.6 that we obtained from heavy rainfall, it tells us that primary evaporation, primary evaporation, that is where evaporation occurred at the, at the ocean, at the ocean or where that moisture comes from. So it tells us that 
it indicates primary evaporation under warm sea surface temperature and low relative humidity. Okay. And a, a, a warm, we know that a warm ocean in Southern Africa is the Indian Ocean. I would like a warmer ocean in, in this region where we are. We, we prefer to create, we know that it's the, it's the Indian Ocean. Okay? Therefore, it, den it denotes that the Indian Asian Ocean could be the source of this moisture. But uh, we're going to apply the high split to confirm this. I just want to explain this so that it, it, it's clear. Basically, we're able to separate the light rainfall and the, and the, and the light, light rainfall and the heavier rainfall. And we're able to deduce that the light rainfall seems to, okay, to experience further isotopic alteration after condensation. But we're able to deduce that, okay, but the, the, the heavier rainfall does not seem to experience further isotopic alteration after condensation. So it means that it carries the isotopic signature in the cloud before condensation or as the moisture, the isotopic signature before condensation. So it, then we're using those, the slope and the d axis of that heavy rainfall to deduce where the rainfall could be coming from. So now, of specific objective number three, it was air particle trajectory models for rainfall moisture source identification. We've already talked about the Indian Ocean. We talked about uh, the various moisture sources in the, in the, in the previous uh, specific objectives. Now we are trying to say, can we then use the air particle uh, models to try and say, to confirm if what the stabilized stops were telling us, if those are true or not. So we applied this, uh, uh, online platform. It's called uh, High Split. It's called it's called High Split. Basically, it, it tells us it, it it shows the dispersion of, of of or rather it shows the the trajectory of air in the atmosphere. You you, you plug in the coordinates of an area that you want to, to if you want to understand how or rather where the moisture or the the air. That, that we have in a certain area at a certain time. If you want to trace it, where does it come from? So basically we used this, this to try and understand where our moisture came from. So it's a web-based hybrid single particle Lagrangian, Lagrangian integrated trajectory model. In simple terms, it's high split. You can find it on that link over there. It's used to trace air sources using the backward trajectory capabilities. So uh, when you work with this model, like I said, you, you can input your, the coordinates of the area of the point where you want to understand uh, the source of, uh, of air. And then you can, you can determine which height do you want. You, if you want to determine where does the air at 100 meters, where does it come from in the last five days? At the air at 500 meters, where does it come from in the last, where was it in the last five days, similarly, a thousand meters, where was that air in the last uh, five days? So, so the input data requirement coordinates of the point, date, and the altitude uh, requested. So that's the data that you, that, you, that you need to input into this model. So basically when we plotted our stable isotopes, we were able to identify two extreme is uh, rainfalls with two with extreme isotopic signatures. We talked up, we found this, which was the most depleted rainfall the most depleted rainfall and the most enriched rainfall. This is the most depleted. When you plot these rainfall events, this is the most depleted, that is the most enriched. And then, so we wanted to determine the sources of this extreme rainfall to say, where does the, the most enriched, where does it seem to be coming from <clears throat> using high split? And where does that, which is the most depleted, where does it seem to be coming from? So, the most depleted was received uh, on the 14th of May, 2017. And the most enriched in that two year period, 2016 to 2018, the most enriched was on the 25th of September, 2017. So we used those two, these two rainfall events to, to we, we, we input the details into high speed to try and understand where the moisture could be coming from. So this is what we came up with. <clears throat> How what high split does is that it, it creates this uh, plot for you so that you can see where your moisture was, uh, where your air was. So what we are able to deduce is that <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> there seems to be sort of 
a similar source in the last five days. If you look at this, this two rainfall, this two air sources, um, there seems to be a similar <coughs> source, which is further south of South Africa, which is further south in the, in the Southern Oceans. They seem to be originating from somewhere further south. That is one. Uh, but they seem to have a different trajectory and residence time in the warmer Indian Ocean. Remember, our, our deuterium excess indicated some relationships, indicated a, a higher deuterium excess, which was able to, which we were able to, 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 to say that it seems to have been coming from a warmer area. But now, our moisture seemed to have been coming from a cold region. As you understand, further south of South Africa, it's, it's quite a cold region. And, uh, but what we we're able to deduce is that uh, the most enriched rainfall, which is this one, the most enriched rainfall, the A uh, that was received on the 25th of September 2017, it spent much of its, in fact, all of its past five days already circulating in the Indian Ocean. It means in the, in the last five days, it was already circulating in the Indian Ocean. So I explained that as, as, as moisture or as, as, yeah, as, as, as moisture flows or moves through a warmer area, it enhances a re-evaporation right there. So as re-evaporation occurs, it means that there is a sort of fractionation that occurs. The lighter isotopes, they tend to prefer to be in the, in the, in the more, uh, in the in the vapor phase and the heavier isotope they prefer to stay in the in the liquid phase so because of that longer residence time in the in the indian ocean it enhanced a re-evaporation of light isotopes thereby leading to uh, a, a, the, the, the rainfall which was highly enriched on the 25th of september in 2017 but now when we look at the rainfall that was highly depleted, which was received on the 14th of, of May, uh, uh, 2017, it, it, it also came from the higher latitudes, but it spent most of its period uh, still further south of South Africa. But it, and it only reached the Indian Ocean on day five, which is also the day on which it fell, rainfall, it, on which we experienced rainfall. In other words, it, there was not much time of, uh, of to, to, to experience uh, those warmer temperatures that enhanced a re evaporation of, of lighter isotopes, thereby leading to a highly depleted rainfall in Johannesburg on that particular day. So this is what we, how we're able to deduce, to use the, 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 the moisture source, the, the air particle, uh, source models and the stable isotopes to try and confirm one another uh, to understand the rainfall moisture sources. So, uh, specific objective number four was to assess the groundwater recharge mechanisms. So, what we understand is uh, there are two main mechanisms of groundwater recharge. Um, there's what we call diffuse or direct recharge, which which is uh, which occurs where rainfall occurs. And then water simply infiltrates through the soil into groundwater storage. And there's another one, which is which we call indirect or focused recharge, where water is lost from a surface water body into groundwater storage. It's called focused recharge. So, what basically what separates or what 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 distinct uh, what 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 uh, uh, what causes a distinction here is that the diff, the direct recharge does not experience excessive evaporation. It means the rain falls and then water simply, evap simply infiltrates into the soil and further percolates to groundwater storage. But this one that, that recharges, recharges from a surface water body, it experiences evaporation with time. And as it experiences evaporation, the lighter isotopes are preferentially evaporating into the, into the vapor phase, leaving the heavier isotopes in the pond so that later when they recharge, it leads to a highly, highly enriched uh, groundwater. That is what causes, what makes stable isotopes, uh, uh, what gives them the ability to assess the recharge mechanisms. 
So this just just to explain what I just talked about. If you consider, if you think of rainfall occurring with with isotopic signals similar to that of rainfall, and then evaporation occurs, preferential evaporation of light isotopes, which are hydrogen with one neutron, with sorry, with one proton and zero neutrons, oxygen 16. Uh, if, as they evaporate, it means they lead to an accumulation of deuterium and oxygen 18 in the liquid phase or in the pond. And which, which therefore, uh, when evaporation or when recharge occurs from this pond, it leads to a highly enriched groundwater because the lighter isotopes, they escaped, leading to heavier isotopes accumulation in, in the pond, leading to recharge. Similarly, Rainfall on a, you know, and, and rainfalls and infiltrates through the soil through what we call diffuse recharge, which further leads to a depleted groundwater because there was no enhancement of uh, evaporation of light isotopes. That's what we're talking about. So in this study, we're able to identify two recharge sources, one rainfall and two, a pond or a, 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 a reservoir, which we, <clears throat> Which is hard to be stored in our case. So uh, we're able to sample water across Hattis, hard to be stored them using a speedboat over the bridge. And uh, we're also able to, of course, to collect rainfall, as I explained. Uh, you, you need to note these two boreholes because we, we, we're going to look at them when we, when we deduce the type of recharge that seems to have occurred there. So this is our study area. Yes, you, as you know, it, this is where our sampling occurred for rainfall. And this is our sampling for, uh, from Hattabi Sport Dam, as, it, as you can see over here. OK, now using that Johannesburg local mature water line that we established, we're able to plot the different uh, uh, data points, uh, the different data points. We're able to deduce, of course, as expected, that Hattabi Sport Dam would be highly enriched. These red samples are Hattabi Sport Dam. You remember book 15, it plots with Hattabi Sport Dam samples, denoting that recharge occurred from a surface water body. Book 15 plots with Hattabi Sport Dam. And also, we, we sampled uh, Albert Farm Spring. Uh, we sampled Albert Farm Spring. Albert Farm Spring is it's in Johannesburg. It's just somewhere here. This is Albert Farm Spring here. It's in Johannesburg, uh, just a few kilometers from that's where we were sampling for rainfall. And we're able to determine that Albert Farm Spring, it plots with the rainfall samples. This is Albert Farm Spring, this brown, brown points. It plots with rainfall. It seems to have an isotopic signature that is more or less similar to that of rainfall, denoting that recharge occurred, that, uh, that recharge occurred, diffuse recharge or direct recharge occurred from rainfall. So focus recharge occurred in both 15 from Hattabi Sport Dam and diffuse recharge uh, in, in other groundwater samples across the, the catchment. And of course, in, in uh, Albert Farm Spring, this is more like a zoomed in picture. I talked about both 14 and both 15, uh, uh, along which are both along the fault that cuts across Hattabi Sport Dam. This is both 14 here. It, it's, it's the most, if we remove the, if we remove both 15, and the rest of the surface water points, bowl 14 becomes the most enriched sample, still indicating a, a relationship with Hattabi Sport Dam. So bowl 14 is the most enriched, trending towards the Hattabi Sport Dam samples. Uh, so boreholes north of Hattis, which are an example being uh, bowl 14 and bowl 15, are enriched. So boreholes that are downstream of Hattabi Sport Dam, they, are, they show an enrichment indicating uh, a recharge or an influence of, 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 of or a contribution of water that comes from Hattabi Sport to them. So uh, rainfall and surface water are sources of recharge. We, we, that is what we're able to observe here. This is uh, on the catchment boundary, just uh, around uh, Johannesburg, around beds. This is the kind of rocks that you find just uh, near where are the farm spring is. And we understand that this these rocks they enhance, um, or the, rather, these fractures, the fractured nature of these rocks, it enhances uh, direct recharge from 
from the rainfall. Hence the hence the Albert Farm samples they brought along or they brought with the rainfall, indicating no isotopic enrichment prior to to recharge. Okay. Now. Uh, I'll just show you what we are doing in Lesotho to try and uh, uh, understand the rainfall in Lesotho and, and hopefully in the future to also try and understand groundwater. So basically what we did in Lesotho is that we established a number of sampling points, uh, one in Maseru, another one in the area, uh, in the, the area at the in Sehlabe, it's just just outside of, of Maseru, around about just a few kilometers, maybe 15 kilometers or so, but the elevation is quite different. It's quite, uh, there's quite a, a, a different a difference in elevation. It's much more elevated than Maseru. Um, so the data has been, the samples have been collected since October up until now. Um, these are the samples. Uh, we actually we we sent 135 samples to the lab at vets and i recently received the samples two days back and uh, <clears throat> these are the samples that we that we, we that we plotted or that we had before i just said that i i, I sent some 135 samples to, to for the lab analysis Remember, this presentation was supposed to have been done on last week. So between last week and today, I received data for this 135 samples. So the, the mature quarter line that you are seeing here excludes those 135 samples. So this is how far we are in Lesotho, but we continue to collect rainfall samples in these areas. We are collecting in Kachasnek, which is in the, in the south, Eastern part of the country, and hopefully we will also start collecting samples in the uh, in Mohoto, which is uh, quite uh, an elevated, the most elevated, which hosts the most elevated points in the country. So this is how far we are. We collected tritium, we collected for stable isotopes. Uh, this is how far we are. Okay. Uh, I hope you are not losing him again. At least now we are, we are almost done. Um, okay, <laughs> we lost him. <laughs> oh dear. Um, Chair, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it seems that we lost him. Um, I'm going to try to get him back. Is um, back. Yes, but I can see that he's on slide 34 from 40. So, um, or 35 from 40. So we almost. It's 38. Yeah, I'm 38. We we are checking yeah. better than me. <laughs> That's excellent. Yes. So let us see. Let us see if we can get him back. We actually got uh, most of his presentation, um, which is great. Yes. In the meantime, I think the questions can come. Either you can raise your hand or you can write it in the chat box. As he comes back, we will read the, the questions to him. I can see there's a, there's a nice question that came in um, from Jared um, van Rue and Jared, hi. Um, so um, Kwasi, we're already gonna have a wonderful question to ask our speaker. Um, yes. I can see it's not coming in yet. Um, I'm just gonna put on um, Kwasi, can you maybe put on your video so I can look at you because, or let us put something in the background so people can at least look at something before. So, um, 
let us share screen let's yes yeah so we we can have actually something to show um while we wait just a ad break <laughs> let, us, let, us, <laughs> let us call it that so um i, I have this presentation i can put it on Yes, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe because there is some there is some of the slides that I also have questions on. Um, so maybe it would be nice if we can we can have that ready and and maybe um, see if we can. So if you can yeah. share that, that would be great. Otherwise, the only thing I can share with thank you, thank you. Can you see it? Yes, we can. I'm just gonna jump to the last one. Yeah, let us see from there on, and then we can already see. Them. Oops, okay. That's when, yes, we pause. Oh, Kaliso, it's, I'm admitting him now. Thank you. So, shame, yo, he can just tell us, and maybe you can help him, and he can just talk. That will, and he can stop his oh. video. Maybe that will make the, the, um, yeah, I think it was almost done because the next one is for references. Excellent. Is I he think back? he's back. He's back. Thank yeah. you. Can I unshare? Okay. Maybe I should unshare. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Shame. Thank you. Welcome back, Elisa. Thank you. There you go. Yes. We were, we were here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I was actually done. I don't know why this. Okay. Yeah, um, okay, so we have done analysis for stable isotopes and all continuous sampling. Uh, we have not done analysis for tree time samples, uh, which would also enable, uh, enables, enable us to, to determine the, the age of our groundwater. <clears throat> so we haven't done that. We are still, uh, hopefully we'll find someone to, to do that analysis for us. Okay, uh, this should be the, the end of our presentation. These are the, some of the papers that we published uh, that have just bits and pieces of the, of the material that, we, that I presented today. So for further reading, uh, you are referred to this uh, publications. So these are the, the people who contributed to this study, the Johannesburg study, of course, the, the, uh, the uh, yes, the Johannesburg, the Johannesburg study. The study was funded by the Department of Science and Technology of South Africa and the USAID, United States uh, Agency for International Development through the National Academy of Sciences. And the data sources are the South African Weather Services, then the Department of Water and Sanitation. Some analysis was done through NRF. NRF, uh, Itemba Labs. Yes, that's that's it. Uh, thank you very much for, for giving me, for having given me time to present some of the work that we did in in Johannesburg on stable isotopes. Thank you. Okay. Very thank you very much, Dr. Liketa. And uh, we we see that you are you are passionate about this, and it's very it was very informative and detailed presentation. And I um, mean, we started from the beginning of the isotopes, uh, isotopes analysis 101 for some of us who are not familiar <laughs> with the isotope studies, but it, it looks like it's a very interesting component of groundwater uh, research as well. Uh, I just don't want to waste a lot of time. Uh, people are having questions already. And I, uh, last week, some people posted some questions and I see they've been addressed in your presentation. Maybe I should just go straight to Jared Van Royen's question. I, I don't know, Kathy, so are you able to see the, the chat box there? Okay, yeah, I just, I, yes, I just opened it. Okay. I, think I, can, I think I can, I think I can see only from 325. Maybe that's when I got back. Okay, no, I have to read, I have to read to you. Jared's question is a, a lot of questions, but I'll try and make it easier. It says, great presentation, Kathy. So very happy to see some other South, Africa, South Africans working with stable isotopes. We should connect, he says. <laughs> There's okay. a, a, a good part. Just a couple of questions. Why did you choose 200 millimeters as your amount between heavy and light rainfall? Two, 
is this over a 24 hour period? Three, are we sure this, that this is representative of rainfall intensity? Maybe you can cover those first. If, if okay. you need me to repeat, I can. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you just, just say a question and then I'll say it again? Like, okay. Why did you choose 200 milli? Oh, sorry. Why did you choose 20 millimeters as your amount between heavy and light rainfall? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Yeah, well, um, it was also based, it was based on the, uh, there's a book called uh, Environmental Isotopes in Hydrogeology by Clark and, um, is it Clark and Fritz? Yeah, so where they explain the issue of amount effect, uh, they also talked about a study that was done somewhere. It's just a pity that I didn't reference it, but a study that was done somewhere where they separated them into, into 20 millimeters up and 20 millimeters down. But when we looked at the data, uh, it was, it, 20 seemed a more, uh, I get the question, 20 seemed to be, maybe we can look at those plots. Uh, Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me just say it was based on, on a, it was more like extracted from uh, what Clark and Fritz were saying in their book called Estimating Ground, uh, what, uh, sorry, uh, Stable Isotopes, no, Environmental Isotopes in Hydrogeology. That's where, where they talk about uh, amount effect, how amount effect comes about. Uh, yeah, and how evaporation enhances uh, alteration of preferential alteration, preferentially uh, enhances alteration, how, uh, um, how low rainfall uh, preferentially experiences uh, amount effect or alter alteration in stable astrophic signature, stable astrophic signature. Yeah. Okay. I think if, as I said, we, you must connect. If there's more to discuss further on this point, you will. Okay. The other question is, was this over a 24 hour period? Okay. Yeah, it was, yes, it, those are individual rainfall uh, samples. So we were picking rainfall on a daily, uh, daily rainfall. So in other words, if it's 20 millimeters, it means that was rainfall, that was more than 20 millimeters on that specific day. That's 20 millimeters, not 200. Okay, are we sure that this is really representative of rainfall intensity? Uh, yeah, well, if we look at amount, if we talk, when we talk about rainfall intensity, uh, isn't it we are talking about the amount of rainfall in a given time. So if this, are, uh, this is rainfall that was received in a day, it means that the more the rainfall that was received in a day, it means it, 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 uh, it, uh, we can use it to, you know, to, 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 ex what, to, we can refer to it as higher intensity because it was higher amount of rainfall in a, in a period, which is one day. So the higher, the more the rainfall in one day, that's the more, that's how intense the rainfall was as compared to the less the rainfall in a certain day. If we had done, a, 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 if we had separated our rainfall such that we collected in hourly, on hourly uh, time steps, perhaps we would, we would come up with a more, uh, a better description of our, uh, of our intensity. The isotope, the, the, the isotope signature uh, and intensity. I oh, think if we had done hourly sampling, it would give us a more of an intensity. It would give us more information on the intensity. I, I think so. Okay. And the next question is how are the heavy and light rainfall events related to seasonality? Hmm. 
Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I think if we look at rainfall in Johannesburg itself, we mm, we we know that we have more rainfall towards around uh, December and January, and we know that in winter we don't have rainfall. Uh, Yeah, uh, okay. I think in short, we uh, we did not do an analysis of seasonal uh, isotopic signature. If I remember well, it did not give us a good correlation. I think I dropped it somewhere. Perhaps I could have edited it as well. I think I dropped it somewhere because it, it was giving us, because we, we had low, uh, low rain, number of rainfall events in winter between May up to around about September, we had a very low number of events, which, which discouraged further analysis. Because if you look at this year, this 2017, it means we last had rainfall around about in, towards the end of May. And up until October, there was just, we just had one rainfall in, 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 in July. So it discouraged uh, that analysis really. But I think it would, it, would, it would be more meaningful in areas that receive rainfall both in, you know, like throughout the year. Perhaps it would make, uh, it would be more meaningful there. Okay, I think I'm gonna jump to another question which is still talking about isotopes because the next question is from Jared is on is at the high split. There's one question from Ntieya Litsapo is asking, is it definitive that heavy rainfall does not experience isotopic changes, or it is that there is no significant alterations in isotopic signature of heavy rainfall as compared to the light rainfall that was found to be enriched. Did you understand that? Or, or we yeah, can I ask? Uh, okay. Yeah, I understand that. If you look at this plot, uh, no, it is not, we, we can't uh, definitely say that there is no uh, re evaporation from heavy rainfall. We, we, can't, we can't say that, uh, but uh, we understand that there is, a, there is preferential evaporation of lighter rainfall. The, the lighter rainfall preferentially experiences evaporation much more than the heavier rainfall. And in this slide, if you look at, if you look at this slide, it's, you said that higher the excess on heavy rainfall means less or no sign of subflow to evaporation, less or no sign. This, I'm not really saying there's no, but it's less or it's not significant, perhaps. So in other words, of course, yes, we expect that there is a, an exchange or uh, we can't really assume that everything occurred under equilibrium conditions. But we understand that there is that motion or that fractionation that occurs still. Okay. I don't know if it's... It's key as well. Let's hope uh, the NTA is answered. Can I just ask Jared to please summarize your last question, your, your question on high split, because I'm just looking at the time and we are running over. If you can please unmute yourself and just summarize, uh, put into context your question on yeah, high split. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Great. Kalisa, I suppose when it comes to working with the high split to try and find the origin of your water mass. Uh, there's just a couple of questions that I had, but I think in the simplest form, it's how do we know that the particle that you're tracking is in fact representative of the moisture origin, right? So high splits only gonna track an infinitely small particle through a three theoretical space. And it's gonna use uh, you know like wind direction, relative humidity, pressure and temperature to calculate where it's going. But how do we know that that's representative of the cloud mass itself? Because on your five day track, the, the, you could uptake moisture and precipitate moisture an infinite amount of times. So how do we know, how are we sure that this is representative of where your rainfall came from or not? And you know, why five days? Well, <laughs> okay. 
Well, no, that, that's it. That's a good one. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, for that question. Yeah, well, uh, uh, it's a pity I didn't also, it's a pity that I did not write the, the reference for one other article as well, where high split was also applied to track the, to understand the sources of rainfall. Uh, yeah, but yes, I, I understand that high split, what it does is that it just tells us where the, the air, uh, the air particle that was, that, that came to Johannesburg on that particular day at that particular time where it most likely comes from. So we are trying to say that, can we then use that particle to say where the air comes from? Could it be where our moisture, could it be the same air that came to Johannesburg at a certain, that reached Johannesburg at a certain time on a certain day? Could it be that that, that particle, it resembles the source of the moisture that reached Johannesburg at that time? But I, 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 I agree with you that we cannot be definite on that. Uh, that is why we tried to use the information we got from stable isotopes. Uh, what does it tell us? How does it describe the moisture source? And also to try and track what does the air particle say and see if when we bring the two together, if there is any meaningful uh, information that we get from that. But I, I do I, I do get what you I do get your 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 concern on that. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Jared, for that, and uh, the rest of the participants. I'm sure there's a lot more questions everybody would like to ask. But uh, I think uh, Katiso uh, gave his uh, contact details in the beginning of the uh, presentation. As well, we will be sharing his uh, presentation for the debriefing, so the details will still be there to contact him further on this, and we encourage that. Uh, just uh, want to say, if you did not write your name in the chat box and your, your organization or affiliation, please do so. It is very important to use this as a, an attendance register and for those who need uh, CPD points for SACNAS accreditation, we will use that. And then, um, I see we also have international participants here. I saw someone from Malawi, I saw Lesotho. If I miss someone, I, I, I'm sorry, but if, if you're from outside of South Africa, thank you for participating. We welcome you anytime. And uh, as I said, we'll share the, 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 the presentation with everybody who attended. Also, thank you, Katiso. Let me just put my thank video you. on. Okay. So you'll see my... Yes, thank you very much for, for presenting in this platform. We, I, I, I remember you said you have more research that you are doing and in the future you might be interested to present again. That is also welcome. And we saw your passion on this. I had some uh, suit to there being thrown in. So it's very interesting that we can talk isotopes in <laughs> in Sisutu. So in that... <laughs> In that light note, I'd like to thank you for joining us. But you can stay a bit while uh, everybody else is is uh, is connecting. But please, uh, participants, you must write your name and affiliation. We need that information. And thank you for joining today. I know we we went over time, but because the topic was interesting, everybody stayed. We appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.